ladies and gentlemen i am samita midiga speak and i am supposed to speak to you or share my knowledge about the infra the electricity infrastructure in sri lanka with relevance to your b paper in the engineering engineering society paper of the iesls pathway to be a chartered engineer uh, i have a almost 20 years experience in ceb so i think i can guide you with some knowledge about the sector the electricity sector but i am here on my personal capacity as a chartered engineer to help fellow engineers to become chartered engineers so whatever i say here is one professional to another and it's not to be quoted in the in a public website or a newspaper i am not representing cb as you would say i am here as a member of the iesl what we are talking and what i am expressing are my professional as a professional personal opinions and you will use that in a professional manner to answer your uh deep paper definitely and also in making professional judgments about whatever things that are appearing in newspapers or when people other people tell you things to make engineering judgments to make professional judgments that's what the engineers are there for and today we have a less of a crowd i don't know maybe the weather or as a less number of people applicants this year or maybe they have got used to my lecture which is i think i'm doing for fourth or fifth time uh, may i know the sort of the distribution of the applicants who are in the public sector can you raise your hands public sector okay in private companies okay it's evenly distributed uh we have two hours i will try to sort of uh, guide you through some information but mostly what i would give you is some points for you to take home and to find more information and definitely i will give you the sources where to find them so what i would do today is to sort of uh make you anxious or make you your mind troubled because i also don't have answers to many of these issues and none of these issues have definite answers it may be correct today but in another day it will be different so that sort of uh, it's not the basic we equals ir questions that we have we face in the electricity sector or any other utility sector in the <coughs> in sri lanka especially in a developing country so i would uh, guide you maybe through the giving an overview of the sri lankan power system the historical development of the sector because as infrastructure it has developed from one point to the other today an institutional overview of cb and where it is with the other players in the field the power system related networks we all are very comfortable with networks and the linear diagrams so i would show you some diagrams power generation and related costs a very uh, hot topic always tariff very very <coughs> uh current uh, topic any day and the future plans of the electric sector and key issues and one of the major key issues intermittency of renewables i will touch upon one thing is oh, oh i'm sorry this look different when i made it now this is these are some figures figures are very much related to our industry to the our profession we have to know these figures but what i am suggesting here is that for you not to remember these figures to the exact numbers you can't do that if you are doing the electricity sector the communication sector the petroleum sector then the other sectors the roads and all that you cannot remember all the figures but what you should remember or we have an understanding as an engineer is that whatever a figure or related to an industry in the country that you should have awareness of 
whether the population of the country is in millions or billions and in millions if it is somewhere around 20 that is more than enough but if you think that Sri Lanka's population is 1 billion there is something wrong in that so that is what I want you to understand from these figures area is 65,332 kilometers I don't know about the very young people here but people may be over 30 or over 35 who are here who have sort of learned these things through the newspapers not through the web may still remember these figures because for inter-school quizzes and all that we learned these things but today they are not necessary anything you can google from the internet but what we should have is that some understanding the Sri Lanka size is something around 50, more than 50,000 square kilometers it is definitely less than India's or something like that so it's similar in other economic uh, indicators also the economic indicators are important especially in the electricity sector it's important even in telecommunication but especially I think in the civil engineering and the electrical industry the GDP is very much related with because it's infrastructure basic infrastructure so when we say GDP per capita 3,600 Okay, we know that we should know that if we have passed 3,000, we have passed 2,000, and we are endeavouring to reach 4,000. That was a policy of a government before. When we are endeavouring to reach 4,000, so those are the figures that we should have in mind. Installed capacity 3,250. Now this is a figure. If you go through CB website or three CB statistics, this figure will there will be various figures because you can't say one uh, one uh, private IPP would be retiring or its contract would be ending from a week from now on I have uh, deducted that capacity from that but most of the publications will have that and also the installed capacity and the actual capacity the <coughs> you know as engineers there are very much differences but what you should have in mind is it's around 3000 or more than 3000 Sri Lanka's installed capacity maybe around 3250 <coughs> and of that 3250 how that is made of I'll just come to you. what you should always have is not the figures exactly exactly you cannot remember exactly if you want now you can find anywhere but when you are having a conversation when you have to make a judgment when you're having a professional uh, engagement or when you're writing the answer you should have some awareness that's what where you are so the cap the capacity mix Sri Lanka hydrothermal 40 percent energy mix what do you what what do I mean by energy mix? That is, last year in 2040, after the ener energy generated, that is 12,357 gigawatt hours. Gigawatt hours is million units of 12,357 uh, gigawatt hours. 40% uh, came from hydro and 60% from thermal. But this varies depending on the availability of rainfall. The peak demand of the country is around 2000, more than 2000, the recorded peak is 2164, but these, all these have certain differences, so these are, you can't be exact, that is what, mathematics you can be exact, in engineering you can be, cannot be, because this 2164 does not have the mini hydros, because the mini hydros are not given exactly, are not updated in the system control as of 24, uh, on hourly basis. So we don't know exactly what the peak is. So that's the truth. So, but it is around 2000. That is what you should have. So we have around a peak demand of 2000 and a capacity of 3200 or more than 3000. So a 50% over capacity if you take only the capacity. <coughs> the losses was 10.47%. That's a good figure. So that is something you have to remember. In the context of South Asia, in the context of even Southeast Asia, 10.47 distribution, transmission and distribution loss. This is basically the amount of energy fed to the grid and uh, subtracting the energy sales, the difference between uh, energy, energy fed to the transmission network and the energy sales. When they are subtracted, this is the transmission and distribution losses we get. So this is a good figure. Be the best figures that are recorded is in South Korea and uh, some years ago I think it's still it's around in the range of 5 to 6 percent but from 10 to 6 percent is a massive investment but this is a good rating electrification level we all, all know that we are in a good position okay. and this but 535 is even below India's India's is somewhere around 700 800 
So you then if I when I say that the per capita electricity consumption, what he, what each of us uses is less than a person in India uses. How could that be? Now that then the question comes to you. Of course, it has a very logical answer because in India it's a heavily industrialized country. Most of the electricity is not for the people; it's for the industry, for the massive industries that they use in Sri Lanka. Nothing goes almost. The heavy industries, we all know that it's very minimal. Mostly this goes to commercial and domestic use. So that's the difference. So that is why we have a less uh, per capita electricity consumption. The capacity distribution, uh, the capacity, I have put here two words, dispatchable and non-dispatchable. What I mean by dispatchable and non-dispatchable is that when the system control or the control center which controls the Sri Lankan power grid needs a certain amount of generation from a generator, it can be given on demand, then it is dispatchable, it can be dispatched with the instruction. You run at this load, 10 megawatts or 15 megawatts, the system control knows that it is capable of delivering this amount of energy at this time for this period. But with regard to the, these renewables, because they do not have storage, we call them the non-conventional renewable energy. The issue is that they do not have storage. All other these things, coal, you, we have the coal yards, oil, the oil tanks and the oil storage at Safugaskanda and <coughs> Kolonnar. Then hydro, hydro has a very good storage. The big reservoirs in Castlery, Mausakale, Kothmale, Victoria. So the conventional sources, the utility is very comfortable because we have storage. We know how much we have and when, how much we can operate. But the renewables, of course, we are troubled. I mean, we are always have a second mind from a utility operator's viewpoint because you don't have storage. You don't know in half an hour's time, tomorrow, next month, how much energy you will get. Of course, we can make predictions, but predictions and knowing beforehand the exact amount has a difference. So this is, once again, the breakdown is, okay, we said that it's about 3000, around 2000 it's thermal, around 1000 or a little more than 1000 is hydro. So mostly, even the capacity is now thermal and almost half of thermal is coal, that is basically the Norachole or the Puttam, Lakvijay coal power plant as we officially call it. And the other oil fired, 1000. Half is CB and half is, I, half is IPP, that is the private operators. And in the non-dispatchable sector, we have the mini hydros, wind, biomass, as of now solar this amount. So that is basically our power systems capacity. This is the generation share, the contribution from different resources, from different sources. Now this is once again something that we should have in our mind, what has happened. In the past, you can't see this. Can you see the difference between right and the? Is it difficult? In the computer, it's very. You can see it nice. Somewhat. No? In 2011, the coal power plants started, and we. Before that, it was basically hydro, sorry, oil and hydro. There was a very slight amount of wind. That is, but with years, you would see that coal, 2012, 11, 12, and 13, there was only one machine. And 2014, with the introduction of the three machines, this coal contribution has in increased to almost around 25% of the requirement. And the thermal, which was around 50%, close to 50%, that is oil, has gone down to about 30%. But in 2014, together thermal is 60. Previously it was 40. So the difference is basically the huge rainfalls we had in 2013 and the drought conditions in 14. So the hydro's variation is still there. Hydro still plays a very strong part in our uh, power system as an energy source, but its importance is reducing a little by little. Oil 
is getting reduced. But the hydrothermal balance is becoming favorable to thermal. So that's what and the coal uh, share is increasing. So this is 2014, that's the last year. We generated around 12,000 gigawatt hours and you would see that quarter of that came from coal. And around 35% came from oil, of which 20% was from CEB and the other was from IPP plants. And this is hydro, major hydro from CEB, this is mini hydro from the private sector and this is wind from the private sector. So that basically made up around 40%. So that is how that renewable 40% had come up. This, the non-renewable 40% or the thermal 40, 60 has come from coal and oil. So now we have a picture of what the Sri Lankan power system which has both hydro and thermal and the contribution from hydro is still com uh, considerable. The con contribution from oil is decreasing and coal is increasing. So that is the picture that we should have. And the generation, <coughs> total generation is in 12,000 gigawatt hours. So that is, those are the figures, what you call it ballpark figures that you should have it, not the exact figures. We can't have exact figures for all the fields that we, or all the things we have. But we know that the, the member of parliament's, the number is something around 200 odd, but now we all know that it is 225 because there have been so much of talk. But it is a something somewhere around 200 or, or more than that. So this is the variation of demand. We will talk more about it later. The historical development, of course, I don't know how much you can you have to learn about this. As I am not setting the paper, <laughs> your paper. I, I cannot second guess, but you should have some understanding. The first light, artificial, the electricity in art, uh, uh, other than lightning was first seen, recorded. The recorded history is that in 1882, aboard the Helios ship, which is a uh, Austro-Hungarian ship, which docked in Colombo in 1882, I can't remember, maybe June, uh, there was an exhibition of light, that is how it was called and everybody had been asked to come and see it. So that is the first uh, recorded electricity in Sri Lanka. And the first building illumination was in 1895, a good place, billion room of the Bristol Hotel has been lit by the Bowster Brothers, by a private company. They have advertised it after that and uh, there are some advertisements still in the web, I think you can if you search, you can see that the Bristol Hotel is, was advertising at that time that they have elect, uh, electricity in the rooms or light in the rooms. So at that time it itself, that electricity is a convenience, had been picked up by the everybody. In 1912, the first the recorded hydropower plant, maybe, but there may have, there may have been hydro plants uh, in the uh, estates at that time. But this was sort of a uh, model built by uh, the great engineer DJ Vimala Surendra uh, in order to test his theories about hydropower. So this was done in uh, Blackpool using the Gregory Lake in Noorelia and that sort of strengthened engineer Vimala Surendra's uh, idea or the concept that this could be done, this hydropower potential is there. And in the same period thermal power plants were set up in Paliagod in 1918, the first and maybe still the last great concept in Sri Lanka, from in Sri Lanka about electricity, regarding electricity, but this was not only electricity. That is something you should all be aware of. It's not only electricity generation, it is the utilization of electricity and its economics. That's what I was saying, economics and electricity, especially <coughs> are interrelated. And that was realized by engineer Vimala Surendra even at that, that time. Then came the different 1950, of course, the Lakshapana, the major hydro power plant. Then came the uh, Mahavali power stations. <coughs> the private power plants and the coal plant. So th that is the sort of history if you want I think you may be able to get this later. So the historical, historical development is important. Uh, I mean what you, we have to <coughs> sort of remember is that there was a 
the contribution by engineer Miller Surendra and how it was resisted for the thir same reasons which were which would be repeated about 100 or 80 years later because the thermal lobby did not want hydro to get off then as the diesel power uh, will not be utilized further. So that is where it started and the hydro concept was put up then the hydro power plants came up and then at that time when hydro was first introduced Sri Lanka had more capacity that uh, the electricity utility had to advertise or encourage people to connect to the grid to get power but with the increased demand there was the issue of power cuts even because the power demand could not be met and <coughs> the issue of uh, meeting demand has always been a concern for any utility in the world especially in the developing world because of the huge infrastructure costs involved and we of course we all have had experience that even 1974 maybe 81 92 96 2002 the power cuts fortunately not in the last few years this is the hydrothermal sham sorry that uh, I have not been able to update this from the last two years again you would see that the differences with the rainfall the variation in the hydro and the oil and coal is coming up somewhere here yes this is coal so this will increase but the hydro you would see that this is uh, 90s the introduction of Mahavali in 2003 Kukule and 2010 Upper Kothmale. so with that the level of hydro energy capabilities increased but this is almost at a sort of peak or we have almost utilized all the hydro resources available so now we have uh, understood what is the sec uh, what is the power system what are the sort of power uh, capacities generation and the history now I will come to a sort of a different thing institutions in the sector now this is sort of important in one way because when we try to understand a sector or uh, an engineering infrastructure or related industry what we have to realize is we cannot get out from the economics as well as the finances related to it and the controlling interest or the uh, what we call the <coughs> interested parties uh, who are involved in that there are many organizations which have stakes or the, we call them the stakeholders <coughs> in the power sector in Sri Lanka the Ministry of Power and Energy represents the government what we have to understand is when we may mean the when we say that the, it represents the government basically it represents the people the owners of our entities if we are public bodies the government represents the owners sometimes we forget that we think that we are the owners or sometimes the governments think that they are the owners but the government is also representing the owners which is the public so the policy generally the owners set the policy for a company <coughs> they have independent directors or independent executive directors to run so that is basically us <coughs> in the in a context of a uh, government public sector or a semi public sector organization so the policy making the funds those things come from the ministry and the main uh, players the utilities in <coughs> involved RCEB the main player there's a transmission monopoly hydro and thermal generation distribution then the government owned companies and CB subsidiaries which are also linked in Sri Lanka's electricity sector that is LECO the Lanka electric company which is a dis which has a which is involved in Leco is involved in <coughs> distribution of electricity in the urban coastal belt in west in the western coast <coughs> and LTL this is the Lanka Transformers Limited now it is LTL Holdings which is involved in many uh, uh, power sector related industries owning power stations, running power stations, projects and 
construction. Then <coughs> the IPP. What we mean by IPP is the independent power producers. The independent power producers are the companies or the power plants which have contracts with CEB to supply power. <coughs> Some time ago, they were the main suppliers of power. They had a majority of thermal power supplies to uh, the to Sri Lanka or the Sri Lankan power system. In 1996, there was a sort of a policy decision in 1992 or somewhere that all thermal power will be by the private sector. But and with that in the around 90s, late 90s and early 2000s, there was a sort of continuous entry of IPPs into the uh, power sector. One may have different opinions. One could criticize why were did why are IPPs operating? Another one may say would say IPPs are needed. There are reasons. Uh, we, maybe we could talk it, go into that later. Then the other private generators are supplying non-conventional renewables. So there are two types of private uh, parties involved in power generation. One will be what we call the IPP because they, these power plants have different contracts that contracts that are unique to them, depending on their capital costs and their full costs, the costs, they have their own power contracts, sales contracts with CEB. But the non-conventional renewable energy, all uh, power plants have to supply power on a uh, <coughs> standard power purchase agreement. The basis of that is that it was put in there to encourage renewable energy. So, Everybody who came under that category, below 10 megawatts, supplying non-conventional renewable energy, got a, a uniform tariff or a uh, standard power purchase agreement, while the thermal power operators who came on uh, contracts got take or pay contracts, what, what we call that's the long-term contracts. Then there is the Sri Lanka Sustainable Energy Authority, or the SCA, or the SLSCA. <coughs> this is a recent organization by this name. Of course, at the Energy Conservation Fund, it was there for a long time. But the SLSCA came up mainly to be the sort of regulator as well as the developer as well as the facilitator for renewable sources and energy conservation and efficiency in Sri Lanka. A very important uh, requirement in the power sector and uh, <coughs> in the current sense, uh, renewables, the efficiencies and energy conservations are very much a hot topic as well as an essential part of a power sector development in a country. So that role is played by the SCA. And the other main role is the PUCSL, the Public Utilities Commission of Sri Lanka, the PUCSL. Maybe you may not have heard of the electricity regulator much, as much as you have heard of the telecom regulator, the TRCSL, but maybe during the last tariff hike, you would have come across the name of the PUC. The PUC is the regulator of the power sector. It's not only for the power sector, but as of now, it is mainly uh, doing the power sector's uh, regulation. The relevant acts, I don't think you will have to remember the name, numbers and names of acts, but you should have understanding of what these act. Because if you say, take a sector, there, the sector needs to be regulated. There should be some governing laws, there should be some principles on which transactions of that industry can be done. So for that, in Sri Lanka, uh, after independence in 1950, the Electricity Act was, uh, the Electricity Act of 1950 was introduced. In 2009, this was replaced by the Sri Lanka Electricity Act number 20 of 2009. And that act gave the power of regulation to the Public Utilities Commission. Until then, the promoter, owner, regulator, everything was the government. And the PUCSL is supposed to be not part of the government to be independent. The Electricity Act was further amendment, amended by the Act number 31 of 2013. So that is to regulate the sector, regulate the electricity industry. How players transacts, how the players interacts with each other. The other is the industries, the players, what are the rules that they are set up. The main players are 
This still on electricity board. So CB operates by its own act. The act number 17 of 1969. The uh, Department of Government Electrical Undertakings, DGEU, which was there before, like the, maybe the irrigation department or other departments, was converted into a board by the act number 17 of 1969 to give it a little bit better, more independence from the government control. Whether it was achieved or not is another issue. And the Public Utilities Commission, PUCSL Act number 35 of 2002, is how the PUCSL is set up. The PUCSL is actually set up to you regulate any utility. At that time, by the in these early 2000s and late 90s, there was a, <coughs> starting from the early 90s, worldwide there was a trend for reform and reorganization and unbundling of sectors. Because in most of the countries, even for in UK and maybe in Europe and in Southeast Asia, the utilities were vertically integrated. That is, all the, if you take electricity, generation, transmission, distribution, vertically there was one company. In England it was CGB, the Central Engineering Generation Broad. It was doing generation as well as other parts. But there was a trend with the open economy concepts. The market economic concepts of the Thatcher and Reagan area was followed by this requirement of reforms and the independent regulators that this all the utilities the government should not invest on them but the government should support regulation so that is how these independent regulators came into the act and of course telecom industry led the path electricity was second maybe water was coming third but and at that time when PUCSL the regulator was set up it was uh, anticipated that all the utilities, water, electricity, uh, even uh, petroleum and I, those three were earmarked to be regulated by the same authority that is the PUCSL. The PUCSL Act gives provision for that but only the electricity industry and the loop oil industry is regulated by the PUCSL as of now. <coughs> so once again the regulator is PUCSL policy maker is power and, uh, Ministry of Power and Energy and all other players have to obtain the license. Theoretically even if you generate, use a private generator to generate electricity for your home you have to obtain theoretically a license. But of course if now I think the regulator has sort of given uh, cut off points or to, if you are generating more than that or things like that certain uh, qualifications without requirements. The license, the transmission license, even in according to the Electricity Act of 2009, that was that the transmission licensee is CEB. Transmission licensee means the operator of the grid network. Even when the 2002 reforms were talked about, it was anticipated that there will be one operator because uh, not uh, considering the country's size and the size of the grid network there was going to be only one operator. So it was, that is how it was going to be, uh, the transmission was going to be a monopoly. Uh, generation licenses, CB does have C licenses, the IPPAs, SPPAs. Everybody who generates electricity, of course, as per Sri Lanka's uh, the laws, even under the Electricity Act number 20 of 2009, only the transmission licensee can purchase power. Nobody else can purchase power. You cannot purchase power from your neighbor. For that, you need a license to sell electricity and the purchasing power is, the purchasing license is only with the transmission licensee. So all these generation licenses have to sell to the transmission license, CBC, CB. The generation licenses CB has for its generators, IPPs as well as SPPAs. And the distribution licenses, there are four licenses in Sri Lanka. CB has four licenses for the four regions, that is uh, geographically, and LECO is the other licensee. So basically, the regulator issues licenses giving certain conditions which we have to operate on. And also the tariff setting is now uh, done by the uh, regulator based on the request for tariff by the, based on the revenue requirement of the 
utilities which is presented to the regulator and the regulator will set the tariff based on the requirement which he will assess and audit and decide whether it is sufficient or not and considering the government policies. So those two things the regulator has to decide on before finalizing the tariff. The revenue requirement of the utilities and from the other side the policies of the government. So these two have to be matched by the tariff. Now we will come back to a more technical type of a, a description just to show you a single line diagram of a power system, a power transmission network for our knowledge or to understand because it is always better to have a, as engineers it is easier for us to understand the flow where does it start, where does it end and how does it go maybe even in uh, telecommunication it is like that in civil engineering we have the workflow or the, the drawings and in other categories as well so this is a single line diagram this is the G is the generators and here this end are the consumers the bulk consumers maybe the residential consumers like that so in a conventional electrical electricity system or a power system the hydro generators or the thermal generators would generate here and the voltage would be increased for transmission to something like 220 kV so this is what we call transmission lines and in a grid substation this will be another generator may be connected so this is all transmission at 132 or 220 kV level so that this is generation this is transmission and again at another grid substation this 132 kV the transmission voltage may be reduced to distribution or medium voltage that is 33 kV in Sri Lanka mostly in Sri Lanka's uh, transmission voltages are 220 kV and 132 kV as of now 33 kV is the medium voltage so basically we have if we think of in a very simple way we have our dal or pariku ala produced here brought on put on to big lorries and in a highway it is brought here and in the high from the highway this is the grid substation so this is the sort of a uh, what we call the pardon? yeah wholesale this is the wholesale distribution center so there it is put into middle sized lorries 33 kV so in from 33 kV it goes to primary substations or distribution substations depending on if it is leco it will be it will go through another middleman that is the 11 kV and then it will come as one one kilogram of paripu like that or oh, there are bulk consumers like the, the hotels which consume get paripu rice in bulk there are bulk consumers the industries where some of you may be working or the big shopping complexes they are bulk consumers so they will get in 11 kV or they will get in 33 kV in middle sized lorries in the normal cadre this is 33 kV to 400 we all residential customers will be getting our <coughs> units so this is the distribution side so it starts from here and sort of radially comes down here that is the conventional system but renewables have done something different because the renewables are sometimes connected at 33 kV so here the mini hydros or the winds will be connected to the system at 33 level and distributed so it will not go through the transmission network so this is something different to the conventional system so that sometimes poses problems for setting up uh, protection controls those things also so this is the sort of single line diagram the Mahavali complex I don't want to go deep into this but just this is the Mahavali and at Polgola is the main diversion which goes through Bovatan and down there the Mahavali schemes I think the irrigation people will know this very well in po before Polgola there is the upper Kotmale Kotmale and uh, Moragola which will be under construction in a few years uh, in a few months time the Polgola barrage and from through the Ukwela tunnel it goes to Bovatan Ukwela the Ukwela power station is missing here so Ukwela power station and Bovatan and from there the different systems system H and all that so to north central province Parakram, Savudre, Kandalama, everything, Kalarava, Giritale, all this goes through this tunnel, Lukwela tunnel. This is through the diversion. If it was not diverted, 
the water will go through the Victoria, Randenigala, Rantabe reservoirs, and then go to the Ulidia Rathkida scheme, and then join Mahavalinganga down here and flow through. So the Mahavali River goes with regard to uh, its diversion, main diversion, and also electricity uh, generation has two parts to go, this one and this one. And here is a good example of the questions or the issues, problems that comes which do not have direct answers. From a power, power engineers or a CB's viewpoint, any unit of water, if you can produce by a certain amount of water, one unit of electricity by sending here, let us say one cubic meter or something, if you can produce one unit of electricity by a certain amount of water which is sent through here, you can produce two and a half times of electricity if it was sent through here. So what do we do? But on the other hand, for irrigational purposes, the whole North Central Mahavali scheme needs the water from this tunnel. If we increase the diversion here, we, we will decrease water, the, the generation here, not by one, but by two and a half times. One unit of electricity can be, can be produced from certain amount of water. If it was sent here, it is two and a half times the electricity. But on the other hand, the majority of the Mahavali water requirement is here. It's irrigation. It's agriculture. It's paddy, the lifeline of our people. So what do we do? CB always wants to send water here, irrigation wants there. Of course, we have always had agreements. Generally, it is somewhere around 876, what is it, Cumex? Oh, I can't remember. Uh, water, that is the diversion. But th that there is a question. You, you could say that if you send the water here, there is sufficient uh, generation from thermal sources. But that means that thermal source will have to be imported. We will have to pay foreign currency. So that is the two sides of the coin. There are no direct answers. You have to take into account the technical, the mathematical parts of it, as well as the socio-economic contents. Sometime before there was a calculation done by our engineers, some engineers, and it was shown that if we pay the certain uh, farmers in one system, I can't remember, and do not release that water, but pay the amount for paddy, the standard price for paddy, that would be more profitable than sending water. But that is purely from a financial viewpoint. What about the social, social life of there? What, what will do they do then? Getting uh, money for doing nothing. Would that be economically profitable or not? We don't know. So th those are the things that we have to think. So and at that those times, these engineering boundaries may not be enough. That is where the policy makers also have to make a decision. Sometimes we are not courageous enough, or we we are not patterned to think of out, out of our box. We are in that box. It's the po it's the politicians or the policy makers who can jump out of that box. Maybe they can do it and survive. Maybe we cannot. But there are certain times where our, what we can do is to suggest answers. If we do this, this will happen. If we do this, this will happen. These are the consequences. So some, when the decision, and we can make a recommendation. But for all that, we have to understand that all these issues have, do not have the direct answer. It's only suggested answers that we can have. In the Laksapana complex, even though it's a, we call it the Laksamana complex. It's not as complex as Mahavali because most of the water is, you, I mean, the reservoirs are CEBs and we use it mostly for uh, hydropower generation. But still, it is this Kasavri and Muskili, uh, Mausakali water which sustains Colombo. How is that? That is because the Colombo water supply from Ambatale is sustained by the continued by the stored water which is be, which is released time to time and of course there is the, the agreement the what there is the water management secretariat which meets every week i think maybe thursday or friday at mahavali 
and they are irrigation, Mahavali, water board, CB, all wheat. And the priority is drinking water, irrigation, power. Of course, we don't like it because we are CB. But on the other hand, if I am a consumer, if I am a pub, if I think of as a public, as a citizen, I am fully in agreement with that priority order. So that, that is what we have always have to think about, that there are two sides to these engineering questions or engineering issues, problems. Then back to more technical things. This is the present transmission network, of course, this is an old diagram. 2013, the main difference uh, in this is, uh, what is in purple? In my diagram it's uh, pink. Maybe it's purple to you. Purple, okay. This is the transmission network of Sri Lanka. That is where we are transmitting the one, uh, 132 and the 220 uh, KV networks. What is in purple is the 220 kilovolts or 220,000 uh, transmission network starting from Colombo. You can see the logics. Of course, we have the Mahavali hydropower stations here. Potmale, Victoria, Randinigal, Rantabe, it is connected to the load center by this 220 line. Then we have the Norachole or the Lapiche power plant, it is connected to the load center which is basically, I mean, now I, I can make a statement which is very uh, bad, that is Sri Lanka is basically this part. The GDP, electricity, all the consumption is here. So one, one can make a sort of a statement, this is northwestern, southern, and the western province make up Sri Lanka. The rest is just there to support it. Okay, that's not a very good statement. But from another point, that is good for you to think that most of the utilities, most of the requirements, most of the stress is on this part. For you, water, for electricity, for roads, everything, and land, it's very difficult here. So we have to supply this. So the Norachole power, comes in a big highway, in big lorries, down to here. The Mahavali power also comes here. Then we have another uh, 220 connection, with this should be, another purple line should go from here to here. Unfortunately, because it, this has not been updated. And that is because these are long lines. So, because the high, this road is long, it takes a long time to go. Of course, that's not the very correct thing but it is basically something of that same so we need a highway to go there so there's the 220 line to Anuradhapura and this is also connected so that is basically the 132 the 220 connection the other side green is the 132 network which is radial it is from this side it is going to down south and to the east from here also to the east and to the north so that is sort of a radial network the Sri Lankan transmission system starting from here and here, the load center and the generation centers, two major generation centers here, here and in Colombo. So generation is basically concentrated to this part, this part and Colombo. Load center is basically here, that is why you would see a lot of 132 lines here. Generation technologies I just want to mention because in Sri Lanka there are so many generation technologies that we are using. We have hydro, wind, steam by from coal as well as uh, uh, the biomass power plants which are run by some uh, private generators. Then gas turbines, of course even though we call them gas turbines, CV gas turbines, most of them run on diesel. The combined cycles which is the gas turbine plus steam turbine, uh, they run on diesel, NAFTA, as well as uh, the uh, Kerala PT, uh, Yugodharavi plant runs on uh, low sulfur furnace oil. Then the diesel engines, the majority of the private sector IPP uh, diesel power plants run on furnace oil. CB has the Sapugaskanda uh, power plants, residual oil, and there is uh, another IPP running on residual oil. So, sorry, CB, CB Sapugaskanda power plant, uh, both run on residual oil. Uh, that is sort of a complementary to Sapugaskanda uh, uh, refinery because you would know if there are petroleum people that it, it's basically the, uh, the sort of the lower side of the refining process. 
the residual oil and the emergency diesel plants engines are run on diesel and the solar photovoltaic that is also there some plants so that is the technologies now this once again don't go into these figures what i want you to is this the production cost so when we think of electricity we all talk about cost of uh, about the costs and the cost for electricity mainly in sri lanka is from the production cost of production and if you have read newspapers you would have seen many theories many information many articles and i can tell you that 80% of that is false i have lost my faith in newspaper articles and when i read about other sectors also i feel that this they are telling lies so whatever it is when do you think of cost of production or when the it is the investment decision that is basic because in electricity the infrastructure cost is very high uh, the norachole coal, uh, coal power plant not would be in the range of 900 million us dollars or when we would take all the costs considered maybe even 1 billion for 900 megawatt coal plant so that is a huge cost and when you consider uh, investment in the uh, electricity sector or in any other sector we have to consider two costs majorly that is the capital cost and the variable cost the capital cost is something you would incur once the variable cost or the recurrent cost is something that you would incur over the years when you take electricity infrastructure infrastructure the capital cost is for the maybe for the in uh, site and the buildings and then the generators or and the other uh, assorted equipment the uh, the <coughs> recurrent costs would will have a variable component <coughs> as well as fixed component the fixed component is the fixed one a <coughs> that is basically the fixed uh, whether the plant is run or not there is a certain amount of cost that you will have to bear such as the salaries of the employees the security and as well as certain uh, maintenance that you have to do whether you run it or not then there is the variable cost which is the basically in thermal plants fuel <coughs> in hydro plants the variable cost is very much less but still onm costs are there lubricants the maintenance those costs are there <coughs> so in investment decision you have to consider both the capital costs as well as the variable and fixed onm costs variable costs that is the recurrent costs <coughs> it is similar if we take okay i think i will can come on to that if we have to make a decision on purchasing a car that is that also involves both of these we will consider both the capital cost as well as the uh, recurrent costs why how if we are running if we are considering or if we have a requirement to go to office which is around 40 kilometers or 100 kilometers maybe 50 kilometers away or 100 kilometers every week or 40 kilometers every day throughout the month and throughout the year so our we will be running a long time if we are doing that we will be concerned more about the variable cost or the fuel cost or the running cost and we will be ready to pay a little bit more on the investment cost because by the long running or the long <coughs> kilometers that we run we will have a fuel saving and on that benefit we can o overcome that additional investment cost but if we were going to buy a car which we would use only once a week to go to polar and if necessary to take mother to the, uh, the monthly medical checkup then of course our usage would be very less then an additional investment for a uh, lower variable cost would not be justifiable so we will go for a petrol car which has a lower investment cost but the operation cost would be higher but what we are interested in is in the total cost and also the time effect of money also comes into account because you have to understand that any cost incurred today the same amount in 5 years if we are using uh, incurring a same 
100 rupees here, 100 rupees five years later is quite different. So that 100 rupees has a different value than today's 100 rupees. So you have to factor that also in when you are making a decision for investment. So, it, so the capital cost, the variable cost or the recurrent cost as well as the time value of money is taken into account when CB makes a decision on an investment on generation. But for dispatch, that is to decide on which power plant from the available ones to run, you will be decide only on the variable cost. That is basically like you have two cars or three cars and if you want to go to Anuradhapura and come back, you will definitely use the next, the most uh, economical one on fuel or maybe with fuel and variable cost because you have already made the investment decision. It is a uh, cost already incurred. So you don't have to make base your decision on uh, costs that have been incurred. So it is based, it will be based on dispatch, uh, on variable costs. So that is how the Sri Lanka, the, it's called the merit order dispatch. The merit order starts from the lowest variable cost and then goes down. That is how the CB operators will start on CB, on the system requirements, the generating plants. And the renewable plants do not have a full cost. Wind, solar, they do not have, or even hydro do not have a full cost. They may have a OM cost, but not the full cost. <coughs> now what I am sh showing you is, uh, I just, these are figures I have from publicly available sources. The, a coal 300 megawatt plants will be in the range of 2000 dollars per kilowatt and a gas turbine will be about 25 percent of that in the range of 500 megawatts that is the capital cost in a full cost this is something in about two year or one and a half years ago costs if we use this cost the coal steam would be around 5 US cents while the gas turbine will be 26 five times this so that is the difference. The, you, you should remember that diesel car and petrol car analogy. It's the same thing. If you are using it for a short time, there are certain plants that you need. If you are using for a long time, there are certain plants that you would use. Now this is another example. This is the plant factor. Plant factor is basically the percentage of uh, use of, the, of a power plant and this is the specific cost where the time value of money, the capital cost, everything is considered. So if you take here, at 80% plant factor, if it was run at full load at 80% time of the time in a month, the specific cost of a coal plant will be in this range. But you would see that the gas turbines and those things would be in here. Below 15% of plant factor, uh, a gas turbine or a some other plants, not the coal plants, would be cheaper. So that is because of where it's the trade-off point where the investment cost and the uh, saving from the running cost. So that is the difference. So that type of decision making has to be done during uh, investment decision making. Then I will come to the tariffs. So okay, let's go back to what we were talking about. It's basically the costs regarding electricity. There, is, there are many costs in the electricity industry, of course, the transmission, the distribution, the workers pay, the equipment. But in Sri Lanka, the majority of the cost, 75% of the cost of an electricity unit that's coming to you is due to the generation costs, the fuel cost and the uh, capital cost payments. So that is why the generation cost is so much important. And in the past, because we were so much oil based, we had to pay so a uh, high amount and uh, with the introduction of coal because coal has in the long run has a uh, uni uh, specific less use specific cost than oil the in comparatively the costs will come down that you have to understand that in the correct context that if the costs of for electricity was a certain percentage from your total cost in the industry or at home in about maybe five years time or even now if we compare to five years back but definitely in 
four or five years time in three years time the back percentage from the total cost for electricity will be if we were you were using the same amount of electricity if you had increased your electricity consumption that's another story but the percentage cost of electricity that is the relative cost of electricity would come have come down but that once again don't Minda misunderstand that the cost of electricity will remain the same no that you cannot say because that all depends on fuel prices but the comparative cost will come down and when you are making a decision on electricity uh, generation we have to consider the capital cost as well as the running cost because uh, the amount the costs differ based on the amount of time that you use amount of plant factor that the power plant is used then we come to tariffs of course not a very pleasant topic to talk about I know uh, tariff in Sri Lanka is primarily dependent upon the type of usage there are other countries for example in Philippines if I remember it's not dependent whether you are using it to uh, wash clothes or to light up or if whether you are running an industry it's sold to you at a uniform price but in Sri Lanka and also whether you use 300 units or 5 units or 1000 units it's sold at the same price in some countries in some countries there are differences in Sri Lanka there is the difference like this that is the columns because depending on the type of users domestic religious industry general purpose that is the commercial and the industry then there is the government there is the hotel basically about seven sectors and the tariffs differ and even you take the domestic sector not only this way but this way also there are sectors that is the tariff uh, steps the tariff blocks you we all know that we strive to go below certain tariff uh, maybe the 180 unit or 120 because we try to get the unit cost down in the domestic there is the energy charge plus the fixed charge in general energy charge is the unit cost that we have to pay and the fixed charge is for the capital cost that is invested in general purpose tariff there are there is the energy charge plus fixed charge if it is a, a lower consumption one it will have only the energy charge and fixed charge but recently you maybe it is for your information the industry categorization has been specifically put out by the public utilities commission there is a seven page document which gives you how and how to find uh, to how to specify a consumer as an industry consumer because in Sri Lanka there are so many people trying to pretend to be industry because the industry tariff is lower and there are people who turn their home in into industry to be in the industry tariff so that is because our tariffs are different of course it is done for a purpose to sort of uh, develop a bit to give a concession to the industry because in Sri Lanka the maybe the cost of uh, power is high relatively for industries but who would bear that that is the issue it would be borne either by the other customers that is maybe the general purpose the commercial so the shops all the shops when you are buying some product from a shop you are supporting somebody to produce something is it I don't know whether it's correct or not but that is the reason or oh, otherwise the government is subsidizing when the government is subsidizing it is further an issue because we all are subsidizing not only us people who are buying paripu in the market who are pay, whose product is has a tax or a duty all those people will be subsidizing that particular sector or a particular person and on the other hand we are uh, subsidizing certain tariff categories or certain domestic categories below 120 I think all tariff consumers uh, subsidized then by who by the other customers now is this correct so you can say that while going on and if you see a friend's bill uh, you are paying less than 120 and you are paying 180 units so you know much you are living on me because the higher tariff categories are subsidizing the others so that is the policy that Sri Lanka has been using it has its advantages yes the, in Sri Lanka that is why we say that we don't you know 
die from hunger or something that is because because there is gospel and everything like that the basics are somehow available to everybody a peop, a ma, a, even uh, the uh, person who is on the lowest social strata can have electricity because of this policy that is why 98% of the people are uh, people have electricity because they can afford it so in that way it, it has been a they are here uh, right or as citizens of this country we all have contributed to that so in that sense when you look at it it's a very good policy or very encouraging one but from the other hand we are all subsidizing some others and we are is but and maybe encouraging others to use electricity so much because it is given to them maybe at a lower tariff is this correct? So that this is another issue that I would like you to think of. Of course, there are no direct answers, and uh, there are the other tariff categories. Of course, you can see that the current electricity tariff. It's good for you to go and lo have a look at it. It's available in the CEB website as well as the PUCSL website. Go and have a look at it. Don't try to memorize, but have an understanding of that. There are these sectors and this level and which are the lowest and what is the lowest it's cost I think it's 250 and that uh, the temples get it at 190 the first 300 units some people are paying 45 rupees per unit and temples are getting at 190 and some uh, and some domi uh, domestic consumers get it the first who consume below 60 gets the first 30 units at 2 rupees and 50 cents while some pay at 45 rupees which is the highest over 180 units so 45 versus 250 there's a huge difference is is it justifiable that i don't know it, it has certain logic against it there are certain logics and this is the cost of production and sales per unit in 2012 as it was for about 10 years before and maybe in 2010 there was a, uh, no losses in 2013 CB made operational profit you have to remember that this is, these are all operational not the, the loans that we have obtained from CPC People's Bank they, they are not there so the operational profit was made in 2013 and I hope you can remember ok well, let us go back to 2013 what's so special about 2013 here you would see 2013 60% came from hydro and wind wind of course is something else we got 60% from hydro the thermal contribution for which we pay full prices the full cost was only 40% so that's why in 2013 we made an operational profit Plan development, as I said, CB has three major with regard to infrastructure development. There are three plans that is, the generation long term generation expansion plan, which is for 15 years, but I think now it is a uh, PUCSL uh, requirement is for 20 years. So the last plan, the next plan would be for 20 years. Uh, and the main, under, main uh, basis is that the generation development will be based on a least cost principle to the economy and within the given reliability limits and it is based on a macro level demand forecast based on the central bank predictions for the country that for the GDP growth and related to that uh, demand forecast will be made by CB and based on that the investment uh, decision makings on the generation would be made uh, and we are using software which we would have, we may have heard, heard called WASP to make this generation expansion plan then the future transmission expansion plan will be based on the generation plan because the transmission what does it do it matches generation and distribution the generation plan is made based on the past data 
and the requirements for the future, the demand forecast is made based on the policy predictions for the future and the past data. And then from this time, from the micro level, the distribution, the different provinces, the different areas, the different depots will predict that in my area, the next four years, next five years, next in the micro level it goes to five years or somewhere around, this is the demand, this we will have. So you can see a demand like this, this, this and then there are the generation points and this demand and the transmission network has to bring this generation to distribution. So the transmission plan has to be made accordingly. The distribution is planned at regional and provincial level based on micro demand forecasts. Just a hint or some projects which are under const uh, construction, Umawaya, Broadlands, those are the two hydro projects, Umawaya which, uh, which is under controversy, which you would have heard of much, Broadlands, then funds committed by ADB for Borogolla and design and fund sourcing going on for Trincomalee Coal which is the joint venture with uh, NTPC of India and a 100 megawatt wind plant in MENA by CEB. And CEB has also done at feasibility studies with other agencies on advanced subcritical coal. So this is a higher investment cost but it will have higher efficiency than the normal coal plants. Generally these advanced subcritical coal plants are in the nature of uh, 600 megawatts or 800 megawatts capacity but of course 600 megawatts is too much for Sri Lanka. And there is upcoming technology in Japan <coughs> which is which they are testing on to having advanced subcritical coal where you can have lower capacities but with the same technology high temperature high pressure uh, supercritical coal plants. Then LNG use of LNG then pump storage and nuclear planning. These are the feasibility studies which have been done. And so the, these are the directions where we may have to turn in the future. And also of course the finding of gas in the MENA basin. The level of availability will affect uh, CB's future planning as well. And as we were talking about the future, I would just show you, show you the So this is 2023, 8 years from now. If you remember in the diagram we had, the 220 lines were only from here to here, then to Colombo, this one and this one. But in tw by two 2023, we expect to have this line because there will be uh, generation, coal power generation in Trincomalee because whatever it is uh, in Trincomalee is a place to use because that is where our uh, sort of uh, the source is. If you are importing oil or especially coal, this is the best place to import because of the uh, natural harbor and the depth and then there would be a highway another 220 line coming here joining the line from there and the major dif difference is that this will be 400 kV it is expected to be 400 kV and there will be another 400 kV express line so there will be a very high level express line one here 400 kV and the other going down to the south and then there will be a 220 line going down to Hambantota because once again you would see that we anticipate the growth to be still here and the 220 line going up to here to Paunia and there are the 132 lines you would see are more than the previous one. So basically the voltage levels will be up and more the country will be more covered up with the transmission lines. Again the requirement is of transmission is to match or to bring generation to the load centers. So the generation at that time would still there will be a considerable in the central highlands from our Maha Valley and Calder resources. <coughs> then there will be the Rochole plant, there will be generation in Trincomalee and most likely 
there could be in Hambantota as well. So those and Colombo. So you match that with these highways and the load centers would still be this part. So you match them with transmission lines and to the rest also you have the distribution, the transmission networks. <coughs> now I have come to sort of we have had a background about the sector and now I would come to the delays, uh, sorry, the key issues in the power sector. Of course, I have not given you any break. I don't know whether you need, but as time is running, I would prefer to continue. <coughs> so the key issues. Now these are the <coughs> issues which have, these are the issues which if you take in the context, in analogy, uh, for, for any infrastructure sector in the country, I think most of these are uh, relevant. This delays in implementation of power projects was originally there in this power presentation because when this was first made, still the power uh, Putlam coal plant was not fully operational, but now it is operational. But when I was reassessing this last Friday and today, <coughs> I thought that I should have this delays as a key issue. As of now, <coughs> Sri Lanka is enjoying which no other South Asian country enjoys, that is 24 hour power. Of course it is at a cost, but that was a policy of a government, of government or governments which decided that, but even though the cost could be high, power was required for the people. And based on that, certain decisions had been made and power plants were implemented. But if you take both of these projects, Sri Lanka's last major thermal power plant and the last hydro power plant, the Upper Kapkale Hydro project was commissioned in 2010 or 2011, but the first feasibility study was completed in 1992 or 94. And the funds were available from 95 and it would have been commissioned in year 2000. It was delayed for more than 11 years or 10 years. And it, it is expected to generate about 400 gigawatt hours, 1 million units of energy. 400 gigawatt hours out of 12,000 requirement. Maybe about 9,000 if it was commissioned in that time. So 8%, 9% or about that range of the country's requirement could have been supplied by the hydro at a reasonable and a very uh, concessionary loan financing by the Japanese, the uh, JICA. But somehow the social economic or the social and the environmental uh, influences were such and political, you cannot figure, environment was such that, the influence was such that the project was delayed. And you cannot blame one part. But at the end, we have to realize that certain uh, levels or the basics or the standards that we apply to our country has its effects in a similar manner. It's same with regard to environment or political decisions. If he makes decisions or if he make influencers, we have to understand the consequences. As citizens, as public bodies, as groups, pressure groups, we all have that responsibility. As political parties, as professionals, as like ISL, as professional bodies, we have that responsibility. The Putlam Kaul power plant, the feasibility study was completed in 1997 or 98, I think, and the updating was done in 2000 to 1999. I think the presidential election was the, in 99, I think. So it was in 99. And uh, Japanese concessionary financing was available for that. What happened in 1999 elections? One presidential candidate, because of pressures from certain groups, may be religious, it may be environmental, said on public stage 
make a, made a statement that I will not build this power plant. The other candidate also got on the stage within a week and said that I will also not. Now that was not the correct way to approach it. Whatever the recommendations that the policy, the, the officials, the executives, the bureaucrats, so the bureaucrats as we are called, the recommendations we make are done based on certain assumptions, certain studies, certain professional input. Maybe there may be people who are trying to benefit, trying to profit, trying to get make fraud out of that. But the politicians or the decision makers, before making any decision, should analyze these things to an end. What are the effects of our decisions? What are the effects of our thinking or the decisions? And here, without any analyzing, without any <coughs> inquiry or a expert opinion or opinion, the candidates decided by themselves or maybe with certain advices from their own that they will not touch the power plant. And another, uh, after maybe another, so the power plant, the project got delayed, started delayed from 2000. And when in 2002, in that period, because the loan was closing, the Japanese ambassador went personally to meet a high government politician to tell him that you are losing on this. What was he told? No, we, he was not even given a time to talk to the politician. So that is how we have made our decisions. And the coal plant was delayed by almost five to six years. And because of that, you must remember that we had to go and finally Somehow, somehow the politicians realized for whatever reason that we had to go for the coal power plant but unfortunately by that time, by 2005, by 2006, there was nobody to fund us. Therefore we had to go for the Chinese to fund us and get a Chinese plant. Now we are all very finely criticizing, very quite rightly because its performance is not up to that level. But we all know that if we buy a Chinese vehicle or a Chinese product and oh, if we had the opportunity to buy a Japanese or a European product, the results we would have expected is different. It's the same here. You reap what you grow. That is what has happened to us. So that is why this delays in implementation of power projects affects, affects in a big way because it takes a long time. The time from a uh, for a coal power plant or a hydro power plant, the start, the time before it is almost eight years to do the studies, to fund sourcing. It may even go up to ten years. Once you have gone through that ten years, if you delay it further, then you have other consequences because the power demand will rise. And what are you going to do? You have to take short term measures. What are the short term measures? You have to purchase power at high rates. You have to bring in power at uh, short notice. If you have to do anything fast, you know that you have to pay. If our ladies want to uh, have a new blouse for a wedding, they go there to the tailor or the lady who is making the blouse six months or eight months before the wedding because they know then that they can get it on time and also at a reasonable cost. But if you go to the tailor and ask to make a suit or a blouse that I want it next week, you know that the cost will be three times or four times higher. It's the same. And in the in the analogy, of course, you, it's the same tailor who will make the uh, blouse or the suit in the same material. But in electricity generation, <coughs> when you have planned for something for a four-year period, and because it's slipping when you are trying to get, you cannot get that technology. You are getting some other technology where so you will have to operate it at a higher cost continuously unlike the sari where you are playing blouse we are playing only once and high cost of production is another issue because the thermal source we have been using has been oil of course with the introduction of coal with the share of coal increasing the cost of production is coming down relative cost of production is coming down that's what i was thinking it will still be high compared to other countries that we all have to understand because even though coal, oil, both these sources, we will have to import for. What about the renewables? 
The renewables also has its capital costs. And the capital cost of renewables is still high. And also, even with if we have put up a certain amount or high amount or a higher percentage of renewables, because the, of the intermittency and the unavailability of at certain times, we will have to put up thermal plants as well. So that incur capital costs. So the cost of production, we do not have coal or oil wells. Maybe if we get the gas in Mana Basin, the amounts which we do not know, and use it in a, in a professional and also a, in a suitable manner, because most of the countries have wasted, the, but a typical example is Bangladesh, who had an oil uh, gas field, and within maybe 10 years or 15 years they have squandered it meaning that they have used it. Production to reserves is a very important measurement in the petroleum industry. You should sustainably use even the <coughs> unsustainable resources like gas. So <coughs> once again the politicians have to be very careful in using those gases, stores, because gas or oil, the resource or the well will end up one day. So you have to decide how you are going to use it. Are we going to use it this year and next year during our term and have a short, uh, lower electricity price before the next election and then the next government they can import gas. Is it how we are going to do or are we going to use it in a strategical manner? Those are for decision making of course, those are things which are out of our sort of boundary. Those are things that we can make calculations and present but the decisions are at a higher level, at a policy level and the policy makers will have to listen to a certain extent to us. <coughs> Another issue which faces the sector is the losses as of the financial losses of the sector. That is mainly CEB's financial losses because CEB is selling below cost. There is nothing <coughs> technical or rocket science in that. If you are in a business or if you are not in a business but you are even in a service, if you are doing it below the cost, somebody should make a loss. So that losses has been made continuously. We have been selling below cost all the time, except maybe in the last uh, 20, 17 years. Since 1996, we have made operational profit only two years, 2010-2013. So why are we making this low cost, uh, selling below cost? That is because of policy decisions. But you have to understand that in another sense, another and then, because our energy costs, electricity costs are relatively high, there is a perception, which may be true, that the lower strata of the economic uh, table of the pe economic side of the people, the people who are having uh, less income, cannot afford that electricity. Therefore, we have to subsidize it. But that subsidy, because of that subsidy, another piece, some other people have to pay high amounts, still the sector is making a loss. Is it correct? Because CB is now, because we are selling below the cost, how do we get to the next? We purchase uh, from the petroleum uh, corporation, petroleum, and sell, in, make a product, that is electricity, sell it to the customer, and for every unit we are making, we are making a loss. And we collect from the people, and try to pay. We are paying first to the IPPs, that is the private generators, because they are private, we have contracts, they can sue the government, they can sue CEB. Then we try to pay petroleum. Of course, you would see that the mathematics is not in favorable condition because what we have collected is not sufficient for what we have incurred. We have paid the IPPs and there is not much to pay for them. Of course, we pay the salaries, we all want that. And after that, there is not much to pay to the bank for the interest and also to the <coughs> petroleum. So we will pay whatever left to the petroleum and there is a gap. And that gap is still there. But when petroleum wants to import the next oil uh, shape or oil quantity, you can't borrow that. You have to raise a LC. And how is that LC will be raised? We will borrow from the people's bank. So now, into this issue of the circle, there is the CEB, which is already on debt, 
and see petroleum corporation which is also on debt because CB is not paid CB is on debt because we can't recover our costs and we don't pay petroleum and then we have to further go and obtain LCs from people's bank and affecting people's bank's performance also so this is all in a sort of a circle and if and uh, sort of balanced by each other people's bank is supporting CB and CB by the LC is supporting Petro petroleum corporation and then the treasury is putting some money into this so this operation is going on like that but it has reasons for that that is to sustain the industries of the country to give the industries uh, electricity at a lower price and also to sustain the people we have 98 percent people with electricity and we have a policy that they should be able to at least have 60 units of electricity to have four bulbs and maybe watch TV so there is logic in that integration of intermittent I will touch environmental and social issues in site location this is a key issue but I touched it uh, okay I touched in delays delays one of the reasons are the environmental and social issues the environmental and social issues are very justifiable nobody we I mean you may have heard NIMBY is a acronym which is used in other countries not in my backyard that is what NIMBY is so any project is okay in not in our country or even worldwide as long as it is not in my backyard I am in full agreement with development. Well, that is true. For myself also, I, I was a planning engineer at CB and I was involved in many projects at the very beginning. And I was I have gone through areas where I knew the people will have to be shifted. And I have always had a problem why are people protesting? But I have also experienced when they came and built in what was supposed to be my playground where I have played in my small times when the government department came and built its headquarters uh, we all got together and signed a fundamental rights petition my father signed it I did not but still I fully supported it because we are all in when we take as individuals we are very concerned of somebody coming into our area but so that is one part and also the environmental effects what will come out of it what will happen to the other waterways, what will happen to the plant, what will happen to the flora, fauna. But this protests, the issues, the effects, there should be limits. There should be the, the of course, in all environmental uh, EIS, IEs, we have the effects as well as the mitigations. So there are certain mitigations that one can do. My personal observation on Sri Lanka's environment uh, rules and regulations is that we are at the start of a project we apply environmental rules which I, I am sure tougher than in Europe or in Japan which are, which are, have the highest end. but while the project is under construction or once the industry or the project is completed and it is in operation nobody is concerned about those environmental regulations It would have been better if we had, rather than having impractical, very strict legal conditions, environmental conditions, to have a broader, strict, a broader outline of regulations, but to have strict compliance on that. We are not having that. And because of that, the projects, not only power, in many other projects have got, and into this, other sectors have so especially the politicians and also people who want to make money have crept in because of due concerns of people at policy level it is very important that you make decisions and stick on to that that is what you would expect from a government from a policy maker you have to listen to both sides to the officials who are unconcerned about the gov the people's uh, living or their houses they only want to bring up a huge plant somewhere in push the people out so that is the one side on the other side the people who are very worried about their living their baking and the economic effect of both to the country the decisions have to be made and once the decisions are made the most important thing is you have to stick by it so that is something lacking in our country 
another key issue in the power sector is the difficulty in implementation of tariff or tariff because uh, the energy policy of Sri Lanka which is uh, approved by the cabinet and uh, parliament published in the government gazette it says that the tariff system will be uh, converted gradually into a cost related tariff cost based tariff what does that mean that means that people will pay the tariff according to the costs and also that it will be a sub, not a based on blocks but has that happened from 2009 up to now no <coughs> implementation such tariffs are difficult due to many reasons which we discuss now but there is a need in that direction and also the government policies sometimes conflict each other our policies conflict each other especially in taxing duties you may have heard that you may in your industries know from one hand you are subsidizing a certain industry or certain duty concession is given but that concession is taken out from this side similar things happen and in uh, Sri Lanka also because for example the duties or the taxes on various poles are different were different at some time now it has been rectified to some state the but CB will dispatch based on the fire based on the final price it pays to petroleum but if the petroleum has a higher tax for a lower price full but the final price to CB is high CB will be dispatching a high cost full which for the country which is high cost the tax component well it will not come anyway because both petroleum and CB are loss making so those are the sort of conflicting policies another good example of current topic is the net metering I think most of you know what net metering is net metering is where if you have a re renewable resource generation such as uh, solar power or even wind power for your own use you can have that source and if you have excess energy you can supply it to the grid which is and you can have you will be built only for the net energy that is export minus import of what you have given to, to the grid minus what you have used and you, <coughs> most of the time you will be having a zero bill because most of the time there are so many uh, companies who are selling the, the, the solar power so they will be fixing it so that you will have a zero bill and it is beneficial especially to customers who are using more than I think 200 or 210 units of electricity here I am promoting some companies mm -hmm. but think of the Sri Lankan tariff system below 120 units all domestic customers as well as industry most of the industry customers are on a tariff which is lower than the cost much lower than the cost and who is supposed to pay that the regulator has set the tariff for a cross subsidy and some government subsidy most of the subsidy is to come from the domestic and uh, uh, general purpose that is the commercial sub the domestic customers are the people who are uh, paying about 180 who are using more, more than 180 units from whom after 180 CB charges 45 rupees so what most of those customers do is they go for net metering they install a net, net metering system and they consume electricity they generate electricity during the daytime feed to the grid at a time when CEB actually does not have much of a demand because of the daytime there is a certain amount of energy which CEB is quite able to supply with its low cost generators after 6.30 around 6.30 when the Sri Lankan peak starts the net metering consumers takes supply from the national grid and all most of the time at the end of the month they have a positive net and that uh, the, the bill whatever they have banked they can keep for 12 months so these co consumers will now pay less than 20 minutes so if they have zero they will not pay a bill so if it is below 180 they will pay for a unit cost at 20 or maybe 40 maybe 30 and now but in the CB budget 
There is a component of revenue which was supposed to come from the consumers who are consuming more than 180 units cost that 45 rupees per unit. But that income will not come to CEB. So who is going to subsidize the other sector, the lower segments, the lower units, which is sold at 250, 350, 450, 750. So those are the conflicts. And that will affect the CEB budget, means the People's Bank budget, means the national budget. And who will feed that difference? Then back to the people. Who is buying Paripu and Hal will be paying on that. The people paying tax will pay that. So that, that is why conflicting policies are also an issue. The poor public image of CB is another issue because that has certain repercussions. CB cannot, was not able to implement its previous tariff hike. One of the main reasons was that the poor image, public image it had. Another issue is involvement of private investment. Now, involvement of private investment, is it a necessary evil? Is it a bad thing? Is it something good? What about the existing IPP? Should they be nationalized? Should they be, what about the future investment? Now, IPP sometimes people tend to talk about as the part who have taken the sort of the power sector into the red, which in one way is true. But on the other hand, you must remember that the infrastructure costs were such that the governments were unable to raise them. On time power delivery was ensured by these IPPs because certain people here and abroad invested on them. So that is the beneficial side, that is the good side, because always the governments find it difficult to find capital investment. And also the investment and the aid and the loans that they get, they would prefer to put into sectors like education, health, because for those, no private operator will come to run our schools on a free school basis, on a free education basis, there will be no investment. To run our hospitals on a free health system, no will be there. So that burden is on the government, but the amount of capital that uh, or the loans, concessions that the government gets is limited. So the government always prefers to use that funding for the social benefit issues. And power sector you can generate and sell electricity. So that the private sector can be led to invest and take the profit. The society gets the service. So what's wrong with that? So that is one way of looking at it. Another way is how much profit the, would the private sector make of it? And how has it affected the power sector, its creditworthiness, the operations of the power sector, and Sri Lanka's economy, how has this affected? How will it affect? So that is one issue. So future investment should so that, that is something maybe you can think of. Whether to have private investment. Is it good? Is it bad? I have points for both sides. I don't know about you. Finding required capital is another issue, as I said. One, the soft loans are gone because we have developed. You must remember that we have become a middle income country and no more the ADB, World Bank or JICA will give us concessionary financing for infrastructure, especially ADB and World Bank. I mean, if you are able to do something of your own, you don't need the crutches. So that is the, we get loans on a commercial basis because now you are able. And further deregulation, that is another issue coming to the power sector, whether this should be uh, further unbuddled or privatized distribution into sectors, distributed companies like LECO or maybe even private sector. Is it good? Would it be good? Would it be beneficial? And another pertinent issue is renewable energy and integration. I took it separately <coughs> because we always, we all have our own ideas, opinions about renewable energy. In a con I mean, general way, we all accept that renewable energy is the future. The thermal resources are dwindling and with the demand high, 
their costs are increasing and also the climate change effect is making us, compelling us to turn towards renewable energy. And also foreign currency. From operational viewpoint, the renewable plants do not have operating cost or full cost as we said. Of course they have the capital cost but the operation cost is less. So in that way, renewable energy is very attractive. <coughs> and the potential in the country for wind, <coughs> of course, when you take wind and solar, many people talk in 20,000, 30,000 ranges, but in a practical sense, there is already a study which says that 3,000 megawatts, getting 3,000 megawatts, if you, I mean, in a practical way is possible, of course, without considering the land, uh, the, you, you can, considering the land requirements, but without considering the uh, sort of shifting the people and those things. So, 3000 megawatts is something that we can think about. Solar is dependent on the bare land availability. You must remember that uh, when you talk about, unlike wind, wind can be stationed, even you can, if it is okay with the owner, you can have a house in between two wind plants, but if solar is not like that, you need a bare land and you put up a whole solar plant and in Sri Lanka, bare land, even though we say that there is a dry zone, finding bare land is not so easy. So you have to make it a bare land. You have scrub land and so you have to cut off trees, so remove all that and under the solar cells nothing will grow. So you have to think of I mean, we are thinking of environmental friendly and renewable sources, but on the hand, what would be the effect? No rain will fall on them, on that area, it will go some other place. So those are the things for because huge area is necessary. So there are other aspects of that as well. So the dendro potential is huge, but whether it's practical. Dendro is where, if you, uh, the meaning is where you uh, grow trees specifically as biomass for uh, to use in a steam generation for power generation. If you think theoretically, there is vast land, you can grow trees and have a good economy like like the uh, homegrown tea plantations where the owners pluck tea and have a self-styled uh, economy, theoretically. But practically how much you can have dendro, that is another issue. But if you take, uh, so from the three main sources, the most practical resource is wind. But the issue with wind is its effect on the power system, its intermittence. If you can store it, no issue. But storing of electricity has not developed maybe since 1945. It's, it's all dependent because electricity, as electricity you have to store it in batteries. As we all know, AC cannot be stored. So the only way you can store it is as a source, but wind as the source you cannot store. So that is the main issue. You will have one thing is planning for, for it. How tomorrow, day after, how much I can get from energy, from wind. And also when the wind increases and decreases, you have to have your op operate other power plants also increasing and decreasing. And the investment, that is what I say when the investment cost for thermal backup. We must remember that there are countries like Denmark whom, and Germany, especially Denmark, which generates from about six, six, more than around 60 to 80 percent of uh, electricity some years from wind. One of the main reasons for that, of course, as a policy, they have gone for that. Germany and Spain, China is also going, but one of the main reasons is that they have a strong uh, network, grid network with other countries, that is a transborder network, the European grid is there. So at any time wind will be, wind power will be coming in, going out to other places and at some time Denmark will be completely run by coal power from Poland. But the next day the wind power will be transferred to other places. So the major wind power users are all have are not standalone grids like ours. That is one of the reasons why it is for a small power system like ours, it's difficult the, the, the difficulty is there. 
So that is why the, the, the issue between the developers and the promoters and the renewable energy supporters and the Sri Lankan electricity operators, there is always a conflict of how, why can't you operate this much of wind, why can't you operate that. There, is, there are costs related to this. There are other concepts of storing energy, of course, one is practical way, the possibility that is been talked about is having pump storage power plants, which is using the renewable energy when it is available to pump water from a lower reservoir to a high head reservoir and use that at the peak time. Well, maybe those are things to come. But all these have an added cost. We all like to have clean power. We all like to have renewable resources, sources. We all like to, we all like to not to pollute the country. We all like to prevent climate change. But all of that has a cost. Are we ready to pay that? Or should we ask our people to pay that? When you take off climate change, yes, carbon dioxide emission, all the whole world is, you know, renouncing coal while CB and Sri Lanka is embracing coal power. Now there is the sort of conflict there. How correct is that? Should CB do that? But you have to think of the other countries. Other countries have been have used coal from the previous centuries or the last century to come up to a high stage of a and have achieved a certain amount of development, a certain amount of uh, lifestyle, certain amount of economic status for their people. Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Japan, United States, all of this. And now they are in a position to decide on which power source to use, which is beneficial to the world. But, and they have used the carbon dioxide that we should have emitted also. They have emitted already. So what about our rights, our right to development, our right of right of a person who is down in Ampara or Monaragala, 100 kilometers from Ampara or 80 kilometers from Ampara who got electricity on Illa this year under the 100% electricity program, who is just starting a well, uh, small workshop, should we, should electricity, should we charge him? Wind power plus thermal backup plus soil. How equitable is that? So those are the questions. It's very easy to say we like green power. We like renewables. Of course we do. But we also like cheap power. So there is the conflict. There is the difference. The demand curve. I will just touch upon this. Basically this is the Sri Lankan demand curve. And because of this demand curve also, we have an issue. This is from 0 hours to 24 hours and our lifestyle can be explained by this curve. At 1.30 up to 3 o'clock we are sleeping. At 4.30 there is a sudden peak because we all get up. We put on the light, we put on the kettle, we put on the rice cooker, we go to the bathroom and this is the morning peak we call it. So at the morning peak generally about 500 megawatts of new generation megawatts have to be supplied. After that we leave the house, switch off the lights, the cookers and everything and then at the office, the office lights, the computers, the, uh, the factories, all those come up. Then at lunch time, of course some people switch off their computers, maybe the factory people switch off but we leave the computers as they are. So there is a small dip and then at 4.15 we leave office and there is the dip. And at 6.30 to 8 o'clock, we have about 750 megawatts, more than 50% of, at this time, 750 megawatts, within half an hour, CB has to start up and supply, which was not used. Think about of this. If it is supplying all the time, 2000 is not much. You get two power plants, ask them to run, sit back. But this is different, and especially getting power plants up. So we are using this for 3 hours and at 9.30 we all go to sleep. And what do we do there? We watch the run depay very carefully. Are we doing very productive work? I doubt it. 
but CB keeps, you must remember, about 750 megawatts of capacity for you to go and watch from the pair. So use energy at that time very conservative way. Well, there are many solutions for the shifting the peak, which is a problem. And this is important. Now, now we will focus a little bit from the sector to your exam. What I have told you here, maybe it, they will put up in the, because it's in the computer, they will put, you will have access to it. But all of this I have gathered from documents publicly available. But maybe the long term generation expansion plan is a document uh, which is available at CB for purchasing. But it will be there I think in the ISA lab, uh, library or the university libraries. But it is one source. You don't need it for your source. But if you go to the other websites, the, uh, these are my sources. But I would refer, uh, recommend to you the major source is the central bank annual report. Read the first chapter where there is an introduction to the economy of the, of the country. It talks about the power sector, telecommunication sector. I mean all these seven or eight lectures that you are going, it's there in the central bank report. And it's a very good report still. One of the few good reports that we have. And the statistical uh, index at the beginning of the, there are about 54 statistical uh, tables, you can't read that, but you can read the first uh, statistical table at the start of the report and the first chapter, the first chapter or whatever, there is a review of the Sri Lankan economy, something like that, which has all the infrastructure. So that is a very good source. Please read that before going into your examination. That will give you most of the background information you need for engineering society. Then the CB website, the PUCSL website and the SCA website. That is the Sustainable Energy, Public Utilities Commission and the CB website. In the Public Utilities Commission website, you will have the draft document of this. So there is no issue. You, you can't read all this, I know. Just glance through them. You have some time. I think your exam, I was told, is around September or end of uh, early September or something. So you have two weeks. I don't know. Somebody told me. So this is something I went through. Recently when I was sort of sorting my papers, I found out, uh, what do you call it, where you have, we had the earlier projectors, uh, where you had to put the transparent sheet where you write it, and there I found some lecture that I had done in 2003, just after I did this uh, B paper, and after uh, two or three of us who did that were asked in 2004 to make a lecture, and in that, uh, at that time there was no this uh, direct from the computer, so we had to use the overhead projector and I found that uh, transparent sheet and some of this, not all, were there and uh, I should not tell this but I got some feedback from some uh, one, one or two uh, invigilators or not invigilators, persons who are making your test paper. And they were also talking about this. I know that when you look at this, this is what you tell your child or your younger brother. But this is still important. Because we have not, first thing, we all know that this is not our language. So there is no issue in that. You don't have to be ashamed of it. So this is somebody else's language which we do not use much. And also report writing, we have tried to avoid as much as possible. Because of that, even though we have experience in our professional ways, we have issues. So, I would say, use simple English. Don't write long sentences. Because when you write long sentences, I mean, if you write short sentences, the person who is reading your answer script will, you know, will be will think of you as, I know, you know he, she has, he has look, written like a small child. But of course, if you have written the answer, he will have to give you marks. But if you have written a long sentence, which does not, you know, the end does not match the front end, definitely you will also forget at the end of the sentence what you have started. It's true, I mean, this what I am telling is true for me, for you, it's the same. So, use simple English, short sentences, correct English and finish the sentences. That's important, you know. In English, it's easy to say, finish the sentences also. Remember, at least put a full stop. Then you know it's 
In Sinhala, you have to, you know, finish Danvami, Giyaya, but in English, you can stop wherever it is and full stop. No? And the read what you have written, that's also important. I mean, do this once and see whether you can read what you have written. If you cannot read, definitely the, uh, mark, uh, the person who is marking cannot read, mark it. And also this writing answers, that definitely you will have to do. Don't think that because we are engineers, we have been in the field, it's the same for the experienced ones, the less experienced ones. Because writing is not something inculcated in, you know, the engineers. We are left brained and all that. Writing, even in reports, we prefer, you know, introduction, background, short, two short sentences and even the PC reports, we write it as much as short possible, maybe more calculations and annexures, tables, excel tables, as much as possible. But here, this is sort of criti critically analyzing things that you have to do. It's important and please practice doing that. At least write four question papers. In that you will practice yourself. And once you have written, ask somebody else, please can you understand this? That's important because, I mean, this is, don't think that I am sort of trivializing the issue, but these are the issues. It's not your knowledge. You have enough knowledge and I am sure you will, uh, I am mean going through the internet and these sources, you will gather enough knowledge. But it is putting this knowledge into a three hour paper or a four hour, I don't know, three hours, three hour paper, that's important. So please remember this, that is my sincere uh, request. That's all. So two hours, no questions from you because no time. I am sorry about that. Thank you.